Can you hear me okay? A little bit louder? Okay, sounds good. Let's get started. Um, my name is Brian Carlson, um, and this is duct tape in the camel, what I've learned from maintenance. This is uh, basically how you, what, what I've learned from maintenance, what you can learn from maintenance, and um, how to make maintenance more enjoyable and less, um, less soul sucking. Um, so, um, Brief introduction, I'm uh, a polyglot maintenance programmer. Uh, I work for cPanel um, on a mostly Perl code base, but we have JavaScript, it's a web app. Um, we have some PHP and some Python and Ruby, and there's a little bit of everything. Um, I've also, I'm also a occasional contributor to Git. Um, I'm kind of the unofficial Kerberos maintainer. Um, I contribute to a variety of other things. Um, I've done a lot of one-shot maintenance and a lot of patches to a different, uh, a lot of different organizations, different um, projects, Z Shell, uh, Debian, uh, usually because I have a bug and I want it fixed and the best way to get it fixed is for me to send a patch. Um, so uh, a show of hands, who here has done maintenance work in whatever way you define that? Okay, so almost everybody. Uh, well, good. So um, maintenance comes from the old French word maintenir, which means to maintain, um, or to stick to, persist, to keep up, the, the fruit is main, uh, hand, uh, to hold on the hand. And um, it also has, the in modern French, you have the word maintenant, which is now, which is of course the time when all maintenance must be completed. <laughs> um, so in, in maintenance, you have to have a lot of persistence, um, but you're never gonna quite keep up with everything. Um, so, you have to prioritize. You're always going to have more bugs and work than you're going to have time to handle them. So, you need to prioritize and preferably, you're going to have some stuff that's going to be broken in your code base. It's going to be, unless it's something you just wrote, there's going to be some things which just are architecturally bad. and it's best to focus on the things you can fix, the things you can work with, the things you can make run as best as possible, and to not focus, and to focus the least amount of energy on the things you can't fix, or the things which are less fixable. So spend, spend more effort in pr polishing the things you can, and l less effort polishing the things you can't. And if possible, just get rid of the stuff you don't need. Uh, I've removed huge amounts of code. It's always very nice when I come up with a diff step that removes 2,000 lines of code that I just don't need anymore, that hasn't been used in five years, that is uh, just not needed. Um, one of the things that's really, uh, I've learned is really useful is to just reuse code, to reuse existing modules. Even if they don't do exactly what you need, it's better to apply a small patch than to write something new. Uh, at cPanel, we had a custom HTTP client. Um, it's been replaced with HTTP Tiny. Um, the benefits are it has absolutely no performance impact. The, the old routines were very optimized, but it's had no performance impact whatsoever. Uh, positive or negative, which is interesting, but not unexpected. We gained automatic redirect support. Previously, our HTTP code said a 300 code, series code was an error, and it threw an exception. And we now have reduced complexity because we have one routine to mock when we're writing unit tests instead of five or six. So it's much easier to reason about how it works. It's much simpler. We removed about 500 lines of code. There's less to worry about because we know HTTP Tiny works. It's in Pro Core 
And the maintainers of HTTP Tiny are far more qualified to, be, to write an HTTP client than I am. And the community as a whole is going to be aware of bugs and fixes that come in, and we can leverage those. In, uh, I don't have to do all that work myself, or my team doesn't have to do all that work. So, one of the things that's really important in maintenance is you're going to prioritize. So some things you're going to have to say no to. And I get questions like these, you know, these, these are not exact questions, but people want to do big changes in maintenance, and maybe that's not such a great idea. It's very risky. You can break things. So the answer to most of these questions is going to be no. And that's okay. You're going to say no sometimes because the changes are risky. People really want to get features and bug fixes out to people as soon as they can. And I applaud that. It's better for users, but breaking things is not good for users. And people don't like to hear no. It's, it's unpleasant to say, it's unpleasant to hear, but if you break a lot of things, your users are not going to appreciate that. And that can be really a bad experience for your users, and then you have to fix it, or someone has to fix it, and that kind of, that's kind of bad. So it's important to set reasonable expectations about what's coming into your maintenance branch, um, what releases look like, what timetables look like. And sometimes the answer is, no, this, is, this change is too big, but we can apply a smaller change that gets most of the job done and then fix it right later. We can apply a 10-line change that gets us 90% of the way there, and we can fix the last 10% at a different point. So you want to have clear criteria for what works in your maintenance branch, but also for just general code style. So we have rules about what goes in maintenance branches. We have a formal set of criteria at cPanel. These are the things that, um, these things are, are general bug fixes. These things are critical bug fixes. These things are development features. And so it's, it, uh, these things are security issues, where they go, how they get prioritized, software, third-party software updates, things like that. Clear the limits on how much time, what, what constitutes a maintenance task. If it could be completed in eight hours, it's a maintenance task. If it's not, then it's a feature. Um, clear coding standards. So having, you know, a wiki page or documentation about, you know, what modules we're going to use and what modules we're not. Maybe LWP is too heavyweight for you, but you want to use HTTP Tiny or you want to use uh, Moo instead of Moose or whatever your, your standards are or you can use these things in development tools but not in the product or whatever, whatever your, your standards are, it's good to articulate them so, people, so everyone's on the same page. And people know what to expect and there's no surprises. And then you can say, you know, this, do, this change doesn't meet these criteria or yes, that this change meets these criteria, we can take that, this is, a, you know, uh, and so we, it's, it's easier to have a good knowledge of uh, every, nobody's surprised. And then I said to say no, but it's also important to say yes. So you, you're going to have exceptions to the rules, and it's okay to make exceptions. It's okay to do things that are good for the end users and that are good for the product or the project that you're working on as a whole, whether that's open source or commercial. So you can add small bug fixes that are affecting a lot of users negatively. That's okay. Or Im improving error handling, improving robustness, uh, RJBS, I saw on Twitter recently, said he was working on some code that had a corner case, and instead of documenting the corner case, he just fixed it such, it didn't ha such that it didn't have the corner case anymore, which, that's great. That benefits users. It's much better for them to have that positive experience that they don't have sharp edges. And so sometimes, but, you know, even if it doesn't meet the criteria, there, there are, you can make exceptions, but it's okay to say no to exceptions too sometimes. So, you know, we want to benefit users, we want to bet if we have support staff, it's a commercial project, we can say, you know, doing things which reduce support costs are great um, and low risk changes. But sometimes if people are like, well, you made an exception for this and I want an exception for that, sometimes you still have to say no sometimes. But that's okay. So, you want to make your tools do as much of the work as possible. So you don't want to argue about coding standards. 
So using things like having tools that automate the process, that automate the coding standards, that things like uh, Pro Critic and Pro Tidy make it a lot easier because then people can run the tools and then you'll fit past. They know if they've met the standards. They don't have to guess or look up the wiki page or spend a lot of time on it. So Perl Tidy is really great for this because it tidies your code for you, it follows a set of rules, and it's either tidy or it isn't. And that's a Boolean. You can check on that. You can automate that. The one downside to Perl Tidy is if you change a version of Perl Tidy, it tidies your code slightly differently in each release. So our rule is after we upgrade Perl Tidy, the next person to touch that code base tidies that code base as if is an independent commit and they need to make their change. And that way you don't mix up the changes in the Perl Tidy uh, changes which make review difficult. And you have pro, pro critic rules and it passes or it doesn't. And these two tools both have ways to override them if you need to. So if for efficiency's reasons you can't unpack dollar sign underscore or uh, it just doesn't make sense that Perl Tidy sometimes puts things on one line which are, makes it look messy or hard to read. It's okay to, uh, to just override it in that case. You can work around that. And codifying as much as possible in the automated tools so people can check it just uh, up front. So we have a tool at cPanel called cplint, which is really great because it does things like checking for white space. So some things are warnings and some things are errors. So trailing white space can happen in here docs, even with Perl tidy. So it warns about that because it's not really, it's bad for editors, but it's not really that bad. So that's a warning, but things like Perl critic or Perl tidy errors are errors. So one of the things that I've really found is useful in open source is just sending a patch. Even if it's really completely trivial, I found, I was working on a Ruby project recently, it had uh, some bugs, the base64 encoding was not so great. If you send a patch or at least a really easy reproducible test case, it makes it really easy to fix the problem. So even really trivial patches, great way to get things done because then you're arguing about the best way to solve this problem instead of whether to solve it. So you get to discuss efficiency things, style issues, all of the improvements you can make to make this change better rather than, well, I don't have time to make this change. Because open source maintainers are busy. People, I mean, even in your day job, you're going to be busy when you're working in maintenance. So it makes it really easy on the maintainers and I've only had one bad reaction about this ever. Uh, I sent a patch, a very, it was a very trivial patch to a Debian maintainer one time. He felt that I was implying that he was incompetent. To, I, I assured him that, that I did not think that at all, that my concern was simply that it was very important to me to get this fixed and I wanted to make it as easy as possible for him to fix it. And that dealt with his concerns and the fix was uploaded two days later. So uh, you can avoid offending people by saying, you know, I know you're vi very busy, I just wanted to send this patch, so you are, so it, to make it as easy as possible on you. And if you break it, fix it. You're going to break things. Everybody is going to make mistakes. You're going to make a change that's going to break something, possibly in production. And if you do, just say, I broke it, I need to fix it. Be honest and upfront. Because people care that it's been fixed, not that it's been broken. I ran into one of our QA people, I had made a change. Uh, Git apply works a bit differently in a Git repository than it does outside of a Git repository. And so on our development systems, it worked one way. On our test systems, it worked another way because they weren't using Git. And I broke part of our product and I put in a patch to fix it as soon as I realized that. One of the QA people said, thank you so much for fixing this. And I said, well, I broke it. I'm very sorry that I broke it and I'm glad that it's fixed now. She was not interested in the fact that I broke it. She was interested in the fact that she could do her job and get the things done that she needed to get done. So I've accidentally deleted a build I was trying to publish. 
because it failed for some reason and I copied it back, except I deleted the wrong directory. I went to the head of product, I said, I accidentally deleted the build, I'm going to redo it and publish it. Problem was solved. So one thing that can be really useful is to leverage your editor and to some extent your shell to do as much of the, uh, the work as possible. So I'm going to use examples from Vim, um, but you can use whatever your editor you like. Your editor probably has equivalent features if it's not Vim. Uh, so Syntastic is very useful. It lets you run things like Perl-C and Perl Critic automatically when you save the file. And if you use uh, some of the newer Vim or NeoVim features, it will actually do that asynchronously for you, I believe. So you can run ProCritic. Uh, I have it run ProCritic with our, we have a legacy theme for older code and a new code theme. So every time I save the file, I get to see all the, I, the changes if it were the new code theme. So I can put in a preparatory commit to clean up our existing code before I make a change. And Syntastic uh, makes that really easy. Now, Perl Critic can be very slow on large files. So if you have a file over 500 lines, I recommend temporarily disabling that on those files because you will otherwise be waiting several minutes for it to run. And so I have a, an extension in Vim called emod, and what it does is it opens a module. In it looks up the module path so I don't have to. If I need to look at the, how the timeout argument in HTTP Tiny works and the documentation isn't clear, I can just open the module and look at it, determine how it works, and if it meets my needs. And Vim has functionality that uh, has embedded Perl in it. So I can do things like, sometimes I want to toggle the executable bit on a script without having to go to the command line. So I can leverage Perl to do that from my existing editor or any other language that's embedded in it. And completion is really useful because you look at the, the documentation or the function name and then you say, what is it, how, are there underscores there, or is it all together, or how is it spelled? You don't have to worry about that. You just have to use the, the completion that's built in. And it's possible to uh, adjust tag files to do it in a more uh, suitable way, so you can have the tag completion. It doesn't work very well for objects, but it does work well, very well for um, calling functions. And one of the most important things probably you can do in maintenance and in general is communicate. So people really like knowing what's going on. So if you just let them know what's going on, send them an email, post it to some place where they can find it and where they or expect to look for it, then they'll know. And people don't like surprises. So if the release is coming up, tell people that. So they're not shocked. And be honest and transparent about timelines. I said, I'm doing a release on Monday. I'm going to do a build on Wednesday so it can get through QA. So everybody knows what's happening. There's no, nobody surprised. And I gave a rationale. I said, I need to get it through QA. I need QA to look at it. I don't want them to be rushed over the weekend. And so nobody feels surprised or out of the loop. Everybody knows what's going on. And this is helpful when two two groups of people come to me with a problem, I say, okay, we'll talk about your problem and tell me what you want me to do about it. And then people talk about the problem they have because if I make, if I take action without both parties knowing about it, then people are surprised. People don't expect that, they're unhappy. And so if everybody knows what's going on, then it's not a surprise. Um, so I have time for a few questions, if anybody has any. Yes. Um, when I came in, I thought you were going to be talking about maintenance programming in general, and I had really anticipated that you'd be speaking about maintenance branches. Uh, and like, for example, in my day job, uh, there is exactly one version of the code that is in production at any given time. There are no maintenance branches to be maintained, and yet, I think of myself as being mostly a maintenance program programming on that production version. Uh, in contrast with something like Perl, where we where we have the production version 5.24, and there is also a maintenance version, but we only maintain one version there. So um, I'm wondering, is the context that you're, you are coming out of something where you maintain both 
your, or the organization maintains both a production version and a maintenance version? Yes. So um, I am coming from the context where there are several maintenance branches, four or five, and there's one production, there's one development branch. And also from open source projects where you may have, uh, say, the main development for Git or several older branches where you'll have uh, fewer, very few releases, mostly of a security or bug fix nature, things where, oh, we broke this, it really caused a lot of problems for people. So I'm coming at it from that point of view, but a lot of things can be, can apply to where you have one main development branch as well. Uh, communication, having good tools, um, good release scheduling, communication, so people aren't surprised, uh, or there's you know code freeze and string freeze, so you have time for translations if you want to do that. Things like that that can apply to where you have major production, only one major production line as well. I have time for about one more question. Yes, uh, I would also suggest rather than adding your tools on plugin to your editor, which is good. Simply also add it as a as hook in Git if you are using Git or whatever subversion system you are using. As, at the end, you don't really care about the editor you are using. You can use one on one side or on the other, whatever. When you are going to commit, it's going to go to the ID or to um, do whatever you want. So yes, one of the things that you can use is is you can uh, use Git to check things like uh, your lint tools. You can also use it to make things if you have special formats for your commit messages to automate those so you don't have to do that work. Maybe one more question? Oh, sorry, okay. We're out of time. Uh, if you want to, if you have more questions, you can uh, run into me in the hallway afterwards. Thank you.